he, uh, Sarfraz is joining, so he should be fine. Good evening, everybody. We are uh, going to start the program for today, which is a How I Do It session. We are streamlining live it to the YouTube channel. Welcome all the members and all the visitors to YouTube channel of ASI. Let me invite Dr. G. Sadesh to take the proceedings forward. Dr. G. Sadesh, please. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, good evening, everyone. All the membership at large, the residents and uh, overseas visitors uh, to the YouTube channel for the conduction of ASI time every Wednesday, 8.30 to 9.30. Today we have a session on how I do it as conceived by our present president, Dr. Prabhul Nyogi, with his thoughts. And uh, we have a galaxy of uh, experts to demonstrate these uh, techniques and uh, these experts are ready to show not only their skills and also to share their knowledge with at the end of the procedures or demonstration, they would be happy to answer your queries as well, which you can pass on uh, on the uh, online, which will be transferred to them by me. And uh, we have Dr. Murli Dharan, who is the moderator, who is going to uh, coordinate and conduct this program. And without taking much time, because the duration is one hour, the maximum should be had out of this time. I pass on the mic to Dr. Murli Dharan, who is the coordinator of this today's program. Thank you, all of you. So Dr. Murli Dharan, sir, take over. Thank you, Dr. Sadeh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neogi and uh, Dr. Don uh, Abraham. Uh, thank you. Thanks for joining us for this program on Ingwan Honey Air Repair, How I Do It. We have a galaxy of stars, as Dr. Siddiqui said. And the first to go will be Dr. Muhammad Ismail from Perindal Manna. So just to add a few words on Dr. Dr. Muhammad Ismail, he's a HOD and consultant, general laparoscopic surgeon, bariatric and metabolic surgeon, Maulana Hospital, Hospital Perindal Manna. And he's a chairman and managing director of Rehan Institute of Medical Sciences, Eratu Peta in Kerala. There's a lot of, you know, like... Uh, and uh, accreditations, and he's got an expertise in laparoscopic surgery, special interest in endoscopic hernia surgery. I can keep going on and on. I don't want to take much of your time. Dr. Ismail, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to ask you to start yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Murali Dharan, uh, respected president, uh, secretary, Dr. Pradap, uh, Dr. Siddish, the academic director, and um, my dear friend, Dr. Um, um, Sandush, um, my co-speakers, uh, Dr. Pavin Bhatia and uh, Dr. Um, um, Big. Um, uh, first of all, I thank uh, the ASA for giving me this opportunity, and uh, I especially uh, thanking Dr. Siddish and Dr. Sandush. Uh, shall I have my uh, video, uh, or uh, I can just uh, share? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Ismail, please share your video. Yeah. So, as Go you know Ismail. that... Yeah. The, That's fine. Yeah. As you know that the, the history of uh, hernia is the history of surgery. And um, as my mentor, uh, Dr. Y.P. Abraham, used to say, that uh, hernia repair is just like mathematics. Um, uh, that means um, uh, there should be a, a landmarks and the landmarks has to be followed correctly. Uh, you cannot have uh, uh, the four before three or uh, five uh, after six. So there should be landmarks. And uh, as we all know that the endoscopy hernia repair, it was a standardized only um, 10 or 20 years back. I started uh, uh, the laparoscopic work in 1993, and from 1995 onwards, I started the inguinal hernia repair. And by 1997, I could able to almost standardize the technique. So um, here, uh, I'm, my, my landmarks I used to have 
uh, once you get into the space. Uh, so that is the space which was uh, a hindrance to uh, the endoscopy hernia repair because uh, that is the only one anatomy we are not coming across in our open surgery. All the other anatomy we are seeing in laparoscopic surgery. So once you get into the uh, retrorectal space, the space between the rectus muscle and the posterior rectus sheath, I will show you how easily we can get into that space. The first landmark I used to tell the pubic ramus, and you identify the space of frettias, and then the Hasselbeck triangle from medial to lateral, then you can reduce the, the, the direct hernia. Then you can find out the inferior epigastric vessels, the internal ring, vas deferens, testicular vessels. Then you find out the peritoneal reflection. That then you are uh, the, the, the concentration only on the peritoneal reflection where you can just take it away from the abdominal wall and uh, uh, till laterally anterior superior axis pain and anterior adequate line. So uh, this is the way uh, you can uh, you can you can learn and uh, you can um, uh, keep on going. This uh, identifying these landmarks, then the surgery will be easy. So a subabilical incision I'm putting and. Uh, then you can see that uh, special retractors we are using to retract the space. And uh, uh, you are standing in the right side of the patient and uh, uh, I mean left side of the patient and uh, uh, the right rectus um, uh, anterior rectus sheath you are identified. And uh, then you can put a vertical or a uh, horizontal incision. I usually put a vertical incision in the anterior rectus sheath. Take the uh, medial leap and uh, then you can see the medial end of the right rectus muscle and reflect the muscle laterally and that is the space where you can put your first trocar. So you can make a space and uh, I usually just put a stitch to fix that trocar and uh, to prevent the air leak and uh, then uh, you inflate uh, usually in the 14 millimeters of mercury and uh, you have to have a good telescope and a good uh, 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 system and this is the uh, one area you have to be very careful because you should not have any bleeding at this space. Initially, many uh, new surgeons, I mean, the initial surgeons, they have problem. So the first, you can go between the two uh, fat planes. You can see that there is a fat plane in the uh, attached to the rectus muscle and a fat plane below in the posterior rectus sheath. And uh, then you reach the pubic ramus and then you make the space with the telescope and uh, you can use a needle to put your first trocar because you don't want to injure the posterior rectus sheath uh, to uh, get into the gas. Even if a gas is in, uh, got, you have to identify and you can uh, deflate it with a various needle. So this is the space of Fretzius. And uh, with the one forceps, you can just uh, uh, take the, uh, if it is a direct sac, uh, the, the sac can be taken out. And uh, then, um, the uh, you can put your uh, second trocar. Usually, I will put the trocars in the midline itself. You can, uh, uh, this is your choice. You can uh, put the trocar, the second trocar, and the lateral end. Also, in that case, you have to uh, uh, dissect first the. And uh, once you reduce, you have to identify the inferior uh, inferior epigastric vessels. Then only you will proceed so that you, you should not injure the uh, inferior epigastric vessels. And uh, the next is the internal ring from the internal ring. You have to see the medially the was is going and laterally the testicular vessels going and then you have to identify the, identify the peritoneal reflection. So once you identify the peritoneal reflection, you just uh, uh, stick on to the peritoneal reflection. You are cameraman and you yourself take the peritoneal reflection away. You can see that the, the fat there don't uh, disturb that fat so that you won't uh, cause any injury to the nerves which are there. You don't have to look for the uh, nerves also. Immediately, you have to be careful. You can see that that iliac vein is bulging out. And that is the one area you have to be really careful. Uh, you should not injure the iliac vein. And uh, uh, there are, as you know, there are two problems with the endoscopy hernia repair or any hernia repair is the recurrence and the, the, the chronic pain. The recurrence you can prevent by doing an adequate dissection and uh, placing a proper placement of an adequate size of the mesh. Uh, uh, and uh, you can prevent the chronic pain 
by not disturbing this fat plane. You can see the fat plane there, and uh, you just keep on uh, close to your uh, peritoneum. And then the anterior dissection, you come to the adequate line. Sometimes you may have to cut a portion of the adequate line. If it is uh, inserted, it is very low, uh, so that you can place your uh, mesh without any fold. So laterally also you have made that a space uh, with a sharp dissection or uh, you have you are uh, you cut a little bit of the transversal fascia there may not need but in this case I uh, just cut it just to make the space without uh, causing any problem. So I usually go to the other side for the other side, other hernia and I'm using two monitors. Some surgeons use uh, the head and hand using one monitor all depends on your convenience. And uh, this is the left-sided hernia. You can see the direct hernia, which was uh, reduced. And it is very easy to reduce if you get the plane between the peritoneum and the, uh, the, the pseudosac. And uh, again, you have to be careful of the iliac vein. And uh, this side, I have gone laterally. Now, again, make the space uh, till the anterior superior iliac plane and then anteriorly uh, the adequate line. And uh, uh, that is, uh, you have to make a good space there uh, so that you can keep the mesh without any cold. So that finished the uh, dissection. And now the hernia, we can see that uh, the, the, it is a large hernia. So to prevent the seroma, either you can make a hole or you can, if it's a large pseudocyte, you can devote it and you can fix it. I'm using a 15 to 12 size mesh. The, when you place the mesh, you have to be careful. One or two centimeters size of the, the lower end of the, the, the mesh has to go in this phase of red edge and the laterally in the same line and the mesh should not fold anywhere so that the peritoneum will come between the uh, peritone, the mesh should be placed nicely between the peritoneum and the abdominal wall. The other side also, sometimes if the, the, the size of the uh, uh, patient is more, you can use a 18 into 12 size mesh the other side and this is a right indirect hernia if it's an indirect hernia comes you have to dissect the sac uh, from the coat structures the coat structures as you know it is the inferior and uh, medial so the sac has to be taken uh, laterally and superior and all around you make a space close to the internal ring and uh, then as far as possible you take the sac out and uh, I usually do the dissection and uh, many times you can take the whole sac out. And if it is a very large sac, uh, you can cut at the neck and leave the distal end open so that there won't be any seroma. If you leave a large sac, definitely there may be a seroma. So the seroma is uh, still a postoperative problem as you all know. And I ligate the, uh, the, uh, the, the sac uh, with the uh, uh, suture, the gashua, I mean, uh, the, the loop, and then you can continue uh, the, the, the dissection in the indirect hernia, and uh, this is all the uh, same with the uh, tepocilia. This is a left large uh, uh, indirect hernia. So the sac, you can see it's a large sac, and again, you are uh, taking the sac uh, superiorly and uh, laterally, and the port structures, you can leave it to the uh, medial and inferior. And you can see the, you look for the, the, the peritoneal fold either side, all around you take all the other uh, tissues out and uh, uh, you can do the dissection. Um, so here I am, uh, I have reached almost the neck of the sac and I've just divided and uh, left open the, 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 the distal end. And you put the um, loop you can hold it with the, um, uh, the, the, the loop so that the air won't go into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, especially, I mean, I'm doing this uh, uh, hernia repair from beginning itself, the, the anterior spinal anesthesia, without the fixation of the mesh. And any reducible hernia you can do, but after the anesthesia, if it is not reducible, you can go into the abdomen. Here you can see that the sigmoid is going into the interact sac and you can reduce the sac and then you can close that port and then you can go for uh, a TEP procedure. So it will be more easy because in TEP procedure, you don't have to fix the mesh unless it is a very large sac. So in this case, I close that uh, uh, the, 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 
the port and have gone uh, into the uh, retroactive space and uh, going for a uh, tap procedure. And you can put a large uh, mesh. So that is the large sac is having an indirect sac. I, I'm sorry, this uh, the, the clarity is not uh, that good because it is a little old uh, sac. So to deal with the seroma, that is the many times, if, especially if it is a large uh, hernia, uh, either you can cut the uh, sac and uh, uh, or if it's a large sac, you can divert it and fix it. Many times uh, this can uh, prevent the recurrence also because you are closing that space and uh, this will prevent the seroma also. I think uh, I've done uh, with the, any questions. I mean, I think, I, I think we are going to discuss at the last. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siddish, Dr. Sandosh, Dr. Murli Dharan. And, thank you, Dr. Ismail. I think that was one very good, you know, you know, exposition of, you know, like tap repair. So though the tap repair was started by Diaz, you know, way back in century, you know, maybe, maybe around a few years ago, but still, you know, like, I mean, it's come a long way. And uh, it was a very nice to see this. I've got a few questions because, you know, like once when you start putting your trocar, the primary trocar, my question to you is, what what scope do you use? Do you sir, think uh, sir, scope? Can we, sir, can we can we ask all the questions at the end of the session? Sure. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Then I think we will go to the next speaker. That will be Dr. Bay. Dr. Bay is going to talk on, you know, TAPP repair. And uh, Dr. Bay is a director of digestive surgery clinic based out of Bellevue Hospital and a senior consultant J.A. surgeon from Kolkata. His expertise is recognized in laparoscopic, bariatric, and hernia, abdominal wall can reconstruction, biliary surgery, anti reflex, and colorectal surgery. I mean, he's got a lot of idea accreditations, just to name a few. He's also an associate editor of the Journal of Bariatric Surgery. On the editorial board of Journal of Minimal Access Surgery. Dr. Safras Beg, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just uh, start right away. Uh, I have a video here which is about 8 minutes 22 seconds. So before I start, I want to give a prelude about TAPP. And I wrote recently a letter to the editor saying that TAPP surgeons have the last laugh. Uh, probably just reminding the TP surgeons that. TEP as a MAS uh, method of groin hernia repair has some challenges such as not able to visualize the contralateral groin, such as changing port positions in large hernias and sliding hernias and inability to use it as a versatile tool in a strangulation or obstruction. However, TAPP has no such limitations. The only thing I want to say is as a preparation for these patients, Patients should be under general anesthesia, head should be low, there should be a Foley's catheter inside, and the ports should be supra-umbilical, not umbilical and para-rectal, uh, but rather at least five centimeters above the umbilicals is the minimum that I use in my center. And here is the video. Do let me know if there is any problem in seeing it. <clears throat> so this is the right side TAPP. You can see there's only a dimple. And you might wonder why am I doing a TAPP? That is because of the painful lipoma in the groin, which we shall see. You can see that we are going towards the medial umbilical ligament and we're stopping there because if we go medial to the medial umbilical ligament, we will injure the bladder. And you can also see I'm staying close to the peritoneum. We are staying close to the peritoneum, and that is the trick of staying away and not injuring the NP-epigastric vessels. So all the fat goes and covers the NP-epigastric vessel. And here you can see I've marked the transverse abdominis muscle and bogro space here. So that's the lateral space, and that's the central dissection. I'm using a bipolar um, here to show that this can be done very easily. So that's the space of Regius medially. The NP epigastric, which raises the lateral umbilical fold. And remember, the lipoma is always lateral to the cord structures. So here you can see 
that once I cut the transversalis fascia sling, I can see the entire lipoma, which is lateral to the empiric acid, lateral to the cord structures. And I'm trying to make a space separating the lipoma from the cord structures, which I've been successfully doing here. I am bringing it all back in again. And you can see that I'm delivering all the lipoma that may be in the inguinal canal into the abdominal cavity. And now that's the cord structures. Both the vas and the gonadal vessel can be seen clearly. And I am trying to separate the sac with, from the cord structures. So once that is done, I know that the cord structure is secure. I can divide it at the deep ring and bring it all to the abdominal cavity so that I can have a good landing zone for the mesh that comes next. So I am now parietalizing the core structure, the vas deferens and the, and the gonadal vessel. The vas deferens is turning medially, which is what the lower limit is, and the structure between the gonadal vessels and the vas. And we must do the tug sign, which means if you lift the peritoneum, the core structures do not move. Once the entire space is created, it's called the critical view of myopectinal orifice these days, where you see the red space, Cooper's ligament, direct and femoral hernia, indirect space, Bogro space, then we can apply the mesh. So that's a checklist. It's called the critical view of myopectinal orifice. That's the concept. And once you put in a 12 by 7 centimeter anatomical mesh here, which fits very snugly in that area, I'm putting an attack at the Cooper's ligament. And then I am going to stitch back this peritoneum uh, flap. Now, this is the only difference in the TEP and the TAPP. So anybody who thinks that TEP is easier because it, this allows suturing, that's not a great reason. The reason should be different. Maybe it's got some advantages, but this is something that you keep on practicing as a young surgeon, the suturing. And recently what I've learned from robotic surgeons is if you suture backhand, it gives you better results. And I'm using a barbed suture here, but you can use vicryl or polydaxanone also. The pressure at which I'm suturing is six millimeters in this case, so that the peritoneal flap do not avulse. And in the last bite, I'm going to go in the reverse like a barbed suture should do, so that it locks itself. So it's easy, it's convenient. And that finishes the TAPP here. Now, irreducible sliding groin hernia on the left side. It is more difficult to do these cases, but TAPP makes it easy. You see, I'm trying to reduce this sigmoid colon and I'm not able to. So what I do is we will raise the flap here. This is a more complex case. So I'm raising this flap about seven centimeters above the defect, sometimes even higher to put in a bigger mesh because these are larger hernias and I want to put in a bigger mesh. And I'm again sticking close to the peritoneum, not sticking close to the fascia transfer. I'm sticking close to the peritoneum. And I'm now doing the lateral space first. And you can see that in this case, I'm using a harmonic scalpel instead of a bipolar, but even a bipolar or a monopolar hook is good enough. So now I have done partially the lateral dissection. Partially, I'm doing the medial dissection. Remember, this is a left side. And I have opened up the space of red just partially. The bladder has been push, pushed aside, but I'm attacking the sac right in the beginning in this case. And the reason why I'm attacking the sac in the beginning is because I want to make it reducible. And this is one of the ways to make it reducible in a sliding hernia. More difficult in a TEP, you generally have to modify your TEP port positions with an ETEP. And uh, in this, you can see the sigmoid colon is still visible and I'm not touching the peritoneum. I'm trying to reduce it and ultimately you will see the sigmoid colon has fallen down after dissecting in this plane. Now I am finishing the space of red zeus dissection. You can see the entire red zeus space now. And I'm dissecting this large sac. Now, earlier we used to dissect the sac from the inguinal canal. And we thought that that will reduce the seroma rates. But we were wrong based on literature, based on experience. The answer is that we will have to leave that sac inside and probably just let there uh, be a seroma. Where there, wherever there is a dead space, there will be seroma. Now, here we are separating the cord structures from the sac, and you must have seen the vas and the gonadal vessels being separated. Once the sac is totally isolated, we put a ligature here. Now, there are many ways. This is called the abandon the sac technique. Instead of trying to go and hunt out the entire sac from the inguinal canal, 
uh, it is better to ligate it at the deep inguinal ring without doing any dissection at the inguinal level so that there is less chances of hematoma. And now I'm dividing the sac little distal to the ligature. We may in fact put in a loop after this if we are not very happy with our ligature. Once the sac has been divided, we have to parietalize the cord and see the vas and the uh, gonadal vessels. Now, you may be seeing that I'm holding the vas, but I'm not putting any catch. And that is why we don't injure it. And that is how it should look like once the entire dissection is complete, the vas and the gonadal vessel. Just like in the previous case, again, we'll do the tuck sign where we will pull the peritoneum and it should not pull the vas and the gonad. And you can see the ileus vas and the nerves here. Largely, you can see the lateral femoral kitchen is nerve, sometimes the femoral nerve and the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve in this area. Once the entire critical view of MPO, as I mentioned earlier, is visualized, we put in a big mesh, 12 by 17 centimeter anatomical mesh. The M is marked as medial. And this mesh is now fixed. In this case, we are not using tag, but I'm showing you that we can also suture. Using a PDS or a polypropylene is a great idea. If you can maneuver this, and I use small sutures so that I do not have problem. And if you don't have to tighten it, because you tighten it, it will, the mesh will crumble. So just have to put in a fixation knot. And again, we are putting one more knot at the top so that this mesh is, is, is going to stay there. Remember, there's a big hernia. So I like to put in more fixations compared to a small hernia in a TAPP. And now we are again closing the peritoneal flap in the method that I'm showing with the barbed sutures in a backhand manner. And uh, that, uh, which is going to be very similar to the previous surgery, completes the operation. So you can see a TAPP has the advantage of dealing with many situations. It can deal with lipomas, it can deal with irreducibility, sliding hernia, even strangulation. One can use TAPP and you can also check for the contralateral side. So that is what my video is all about. I will be open to questions in the end as the moderator wishes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Prath. Tikra, that was a very good, uh, you know, like uh, show of how you could do a TAPP repair. I mean, easily understandable to even a beginner on how to start with it. So we will take the questions at the end of, you know, like uh, Dr. Bhatia's presentation. So the next to go will be Dr. Bhatia. Dr. Parveen Bhatia is from the Institute of Minimal Access Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery from Sir Ganga Ram Hospital, New Delhi. He's also a medical director and consultant laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon, Global Hospital and Endosurgery Institute, New Delhi. I don't think, you know, he needs any introduction, but just to, you know, complete bottomies on the editorial board of Journal of Minimal Access Surgery, Surgical Clinics of India. He's been an author and co-author of a lot of books and his field of interest is lab hernia repair, bariatric surgery, and single incision lab surgery. Dr. Bhatia, please. Thank you, ASI, for giving this opportunity to speak on how I do it and ETEP. If I want to give one slide, and this is the slide that eyes don't lie. Our thinking is that when we are doing the hernia repair, I am not married to TAPP or TP or ETEP. Uh, I was told by a few surgeons that we do all the three because ultimately the anatomy remains the same. There are situations in which, for example, I would reserve the TAPP only for those in which I am not able to reduce the hernia on the operation table. Now, in this video, I am just demonstrating an enhanced or extended TEP, totally extra peritoneal. So we place our hand onto the pubic ramus and the anterior superior leg spine and then reached the mid inguinal point. And here, as we are going to demonstrate the left side E tap, I am standing on the left side of the patient and first port entry has to be far above the level of umbilicus. And we lately have started using a bariatric length OptiView trocar 
and we are using the zero degree 10 mm scope. The first primary entry is done with the help of 10 or 11 mm in season and we go layer by layer means we are able to see the skin, <clears throat> subcutaneous tissue, camper, scarpa and as we are rotating with the 360 degree movement then we are able to see the anterior rectus sheath gone, rectus muscle seen, posterior rectus can be seen and now we change the direction of our opti view towards the foot end of the patient and we carry on taking the advantage of the glass bladed trocar means eyes don't lie. We are going close to the posterior rectus sheath as if we are droning over the posterior rectus sheath and carry on moving towards the pubic ramus and the pubic bone. We do not want to injure even a small vessel. And as you can see that I am trying to push on to the tissues also from the medial border of the rectus muscle. And once we have created this space, then we take the OptiView cannula out and make the two secondary ports as Dr. Ismail had also used the needle. We call this as GPS. So we are giving infra umbilical midline two secondary five millimeter ports. And we should make sure that when we are giving an incision with the help of artery forceps, we just tease the anterior rectus sheath and then go in with the cannula so that we do not cause any injury to the peritoneum or to the posterior rectus sheath. And once we have gone in, then Again, we develop the plane with the help of harmonic ace on my right hand and hunter grasper on my left hand. According to us, the fat belongs to the anterior abdominal wall and we should remain close to the peritoneum, close to the white structure so that ultimately we are able to develop a excellent space of radius and we will be able to place in a mesh. Again, as um, lined by Dr. Sarfraz also, in back of our mind, we are always careful about developing the critical view of myopectineal orifice. Our thinking is that once we have started moving, now one can see on the top that this is a inferior epigastric vessels. They should remain clad in the fascia transversalis. And it should be that we are able to see the white house and the light house use the energy source as minimum as possible. For example, I have seen many surgeons barbecuing the tissues. Our thinking is no, there is no point in barbecuing. If you feel that there is a small oozer, then definitely yes. And as we are doing the swimming movements, you can appreciate that this is a fascia transversalis. Our intention is to remain close to the single cell thick peritoneum, single cell thick peritoneum and not extra fascia transversalis. If we go in between the two lamina of fascia transversalis, then we are going to injure the the inferior epigastric vessels and we may unnecessarily cause the blurring of the vision because of the blood inside this limited space. So our thinking is that remain close to the peritoneum, follow the white and you are always right. Means you had followed the pubic ramus, pubic bone, we have now following the peritoneum and then we do not ever hold the vas and the vessels, but we hold the peritoneum, single cell thick peritoneum, and then make sure that the triangle of doom is created from the angle of doom. And again and again, because my topic is ETAP, I will again go into the next video. In this, I would just compare that initially the left TEP had been done and today we are going to demonstrate the right ETAP. Again, the space is the first port entry is from the right side and we are going standing also on the right side of the patient and then with the help of 
10 degrees, 0 degrees. So basically, why did I switch over from TEP or TAPP to ETAPS is that I do not need the assistance. This glass bladed trocar eyes are assisting me. I am going layer by layer in. As soon as I see the anterior rectus sheath, I am giving the 360 degree muscle rotation of the cannula and zero degree scope. As soon as I cross the rectus muscle, then we do not perforate the posterior rectus sheath and the peritoneum and go on to the posterior rectus sheath and carry on moving in. So what I mean to say is that ultimately, this is a limited space. And if we are able to see every small vessel, every small single structure under vision, most of the job is done. We don't have to use the balloon. We don't have used to use the saline or finger star glove or any other or the even the tip of the scope. We definitely use only the optibutrocar and with the help of glass blade, you can appreciate how beautifully the loose areolar tissue makes the way for us. In this position, I would say that we request our anesthetist to put the patient 10 degree head low and then flex the patient also, so that ultimately we are moving towards the White House and the Lighthouse. Because in this case, the left TEP had already been done, so there is no point in going towards the left side. We will remain ourselves towards the right side, and we definitely would love to make a space in the retropubic cave of Red CS by two centimeters. For example, Jorge Dias had beautifully said that if you do not lay down the mesh in the retropubic cave of Red CS by two centimeters, when the bladder gets distended, the mesh inferior margin can get rolled in or rolled up. And that can lead to medial most recurrence. So we do not want to have any recurrence in such situation. So and plus, more important is that we should not have any medial recurrence also. In this situation, you can see beautifully that once we go in, the bleeding is not there and we are not using much of the energy source. We carry on developing the, and uh, we make the movements in such a way that on my right hand is the harmonic, on the left hand is the grasper, hunter grasper, and then we carry on going in, and ultimately, once we make a space, then we start going towards the pubic bone and the ramus. Again and again, our intention is loud and clear that we do not want to injure the external iliac vein or external iliac artery. We do not want to manhandle the vas and the vessels. We do not want to manhandle or injure the vessels which are present onto the pubic ramus. The recutusial vein of Bendavid can be injured in this space and unnecessary bleeding will occur. And when we are going to dissect onto the lateral aspect, you can appreciate that we are just close to the posterior rectus sheath the fat belongs to the anterior abdominal wall. One can see beautifully the peritoneum lining and our endeavor is again and again that this is called as totally extra peritoneal hernia repair rather than totally extra fascia transosalis hernia repair. So we remain clinging on to the peritoneum First, we are taking care that fat belongs to the anterior abdominal wall. We create a space and both medially as well as laterally, just by pushing, teasing movements, we are taking the tissues off and we go up to the swas muscle. Aim is that the inferior margin of the mesh when we are laying of the mesh of 15 by 12 centimeters at least it should not get rolled in or rolled out. 
And if we are not able to demonstrate swas muscle to our younger colleagues or the nerves, that means we are not doing the justice. You can appreciate the swas muscle. The vas and the vessels are not at all handled and we are still cl remaining close to the peritoneum. And yes, as has been pointed out, that if it is a large defect, then one should one can leave the fundus of the sac behind so that ultimately, but make sure that we are not leaving the blood behind so that the chances of seroma formation are reduced to as minimum as possible. And if it is a direct defect, then we, if it is a large direct defect, then we may take the pseudo sac and cling it on to the pubic ramus or the Cooper's ligament, tack it so that ultimately we are able to uh, reduce the chances of seroma. And then now once the dissection has been done, we are just going to make sure that we place in a mesh again and again we fold the mesh half and half and then go in medially. We have rounded off the medial aspect so that we do not cause any injury to the bladder. My main interest is to see the inferior margin of the mesh resting absolutely comfortable and two centimeters have gone into the cave of Redzius. We strongly believe on fixing the mesh in every and any situation so that the mesh migration is not seen. And once the two tags have been applied onto the Cooper's ligament, then we open the suture onto the mid portion of the mesh which has been applied and unfurl it onto the floor it becomes easier. And the advantage of ETEP is that we have got enough of space, extra space as compared to TEP and the mesh is resting absolutely comfortable. Again and again, when we are going to desufflate, then insufflate, the mesh should rest absolutely comfortable. That is the, and in the end, in 40 seconds, I would definitely say, if you are not updated, you are outdated. And if you want to become a modern crow, the crows were there which were doing the pebbles and then they were using the straw. And now the modern crow, you can see that how beautifully it has opened the tap and quenching its breath. So our thinking is remain a learner, never ever became, become a learned. And if you are not updated, you are outdated. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. That was lovely. The videos were very clear, even for a beginner to you know identify the anatomical structures, which was very well shown. And uh, some of your slides on how to be updated and how you're going to be left out if you're not updated. I thought that was a very good thing to say. So I think, you know, like now that the three experts have given their views, one on a TEP repair, next was a TAPP repair, last but not the least by an ETEP repair by Dr. Parveen Bhatia. So we thought, you know, we will take some questions. There are questions coming up in the, you know, um, our YouTube channel as well. And we are picking up all those questions and we will be asking our own experts this. So to start with, you know, like some of the, question that came up for TEP. So let me start with the TEP questions, basically. The first question is from Guru Shantapa Yagalanchi. Is in TEP, if it's a direct hernia, is it not required to dissect the cord? The question to Dr. Ismail, please. You have to uh, dissect from the midline uh, to the anterior superior iliac spine. So the peritoneum has to taken away from the uh, cord structures and the peritoneum that is the, uh, the the best way to prevent the the uh, recurrence because you have to place the mesh uh, below the uh, pubic ramus and the same level the lower end of the mesh has to be there for that the peritoneum has to be uh, dissected from the cord structures okay thank you thank you so much i hope that has answered the question now, a question for myself. I mean, in a TEP repair, would you prefer to fix your mesh or not to fix your mesh? There's if no so, need. why? 
yeah there's no need for uh, fixing the mesh uh, in tep except if there is a large uh, defect uh, then you should not uh, cause a meshoma if you are not fixing sometimes the mesh the whole mesh may go into the uh, the, the defect so for that what we can we can if it's a large mesh a pseudo sac can be uh, everted and it can be fixed to the uh, rectus muscle and uh, the you can put two or three uh, fix uh, uh, the, the tackers or the sutures uh, to the mesh so that the mesh won't uh, displace. Uh, but in general, I think most of the more than 90% of the uh, cases, you don't have to push, uh, uh, put the, uh, fix the mesh. Because when I started the endoscopy hernia repair, we were doing all a beautiful open hernia repair with a small uh, incision, uh, Lechenstein. And when we change from a one good technique to another good technique, it has to be comparable. In 1995, the problem was that the patient needed GA and that the patient needed tackles, which both causes the cost to the patient. Where I am working, I mean, still working, the cost is a factor. So what? that's why I started uh, doing the repair under spinal anesthesia without fixation of the mesh. And I found it is good because the first paper I published in the Journal of Hernia in 2009 of uh, 1,220 uh, hernias without uh, fixation of the mesh under spinal anesthesia and a uh, few more uh, papers. I And uh, the almost the same patients I am now following up and uh, we are on the work after the 20 years, uh, uh, even though we are getting almost 30 uh, to 40 percent of the follow-up, we are coming out with the paper that this still that is a good technique. Uh, uh, you don't have to fix the mesh if it is in the tap. The next question from the channel is, you know, like tips to handle a pseudo sac, sir. Pardon me? So Dr. Ismail. Yeah. Pseudo sac? Yes, they want to know what the tips you would want to give us to handle yeah. the pseudo sac. I told you, if it is a small sac, you can just make a hole in the pseudo sac so that there won't be any problem. The the the, the body fluid or the some uh, uh, the the uh, seroma which will get absorbed into the subcutaneous tissue. But you have to be careful if the patient is on the blood thinners, uh, the the uh, clotlet and all. The, you can get a a small oozing in the posture operativity. Uh, those type of the cases, you have to be more careful. Uh, even some cases, you may have to put a train uh, so that uh, you can remove the train after 24 hours uh, to prevent the seroma. And uh, again, you can put a bowl outside and keep that bowl for 48 hours, even though, I mean, the literature says that won't work, but uh, still, I used to put a external pressure uh, if there is a large uh, uh, hernia and that will keep it for 48 hours and the seroma still can happen but considerably it has reduced you know thank you so much i think that you answered the next question as well tricks to avoid you know like seromas and so on and so forth i think now i'll move on to dr bay will you close the large defect in a tapp dr bay that is a question that's come out of the channel uh, yes, there has been some interest in closure of the defects, uh, especially in direct hernias, so to reduce recurrence in the larger ones, as well as to put in a good landing zone for the mesh. However, this was tried in Singapore, and that was the largest series, and they called it TEP Plus, and it didn't work. They have given it up. So uh, you cannot possibly... Um, uh, you know, do it with the hope that it's going to work because one center has already given up. In indirect hernia, that question doesn't arise because trying to close the defect of the indirect defect would lead to strangulation of the cause structures potentially. So right now, as far as literature is concerned, and as well as my own personal experience, I do not think defect closure seems to be a feasible or a safe option. Thank you so much. The next question is, how much difficult it would be if you put an incision 7 centimeter above the internal ring? This is a question from the channel again. 
Good question. I think I made it twice. I said it twice because of a particular reason. Remember, you're putting in a 15 by 12 centimeter mesh minimum, or you're putting in a 17 by 12 centimeter mesh. What does it mean? It means at least half of it is above the deep ring, which means at least six centimeters above the deep ring. And I would argue that sometimes surgeons are not able to place uh, the entire half of it below the ilupubic tract. This is probably five centimeters. So, you know, you're probably putting in seven centimeters above the deep ring. So it is my own impression that when we see her groin hernias in a TAPP, we have this liberty to understand where to put in the incision. And the incision should not be at least less than seven centimeters. You can put it eight centimeters above the deep ring. You can put it nine centimeters above the deep ring but definitely not less than seven centimeters below the deep ring. And therefore the ports should always be supraumbilical and not at the umbilical level. That's a very rookie mistake that surgeons doing TAPP do, and they should not do it. Thank you very much. I think, you know, like you, you are the one who mentioned a few nice things to put up for the beginners to go with. When you start doing a hernia repair, first put a polyscatheter, general anesthesia, put the head and down, and so on and so forth. Lovely tips for a beginner. I mean, whoever is watching this program, I think, you know, should follow all these things. The other thing which I found was your bipolar usage of bipolar when you dissect. That is something also good. But as, you know, Dr. Bhatia did mention, you don't fry the tissues, but, you know, you know, take it as and when you get into a bleeder. I think that's a very good technique that was given. And that also suggested that, the chance of developing a seroma is minimal if you were to take care of the bleeder at the time of, you know, like your uh, incision or uh, in the dissection. So this question is for Dr. Bhatia. If supraumbilical incision, will you, you if supraumbilical incision, will you use longer instruments? In the supra, if I am giving the supra umbilical incision and that too on the left side, then lately we have started using the long trocar, that means the bariatric length trocar, rather okay. than the 12 mm, 12 centimeter small trocar. But there is no need of longer instruments. As okay. all of us know, the span of the patient is not very big if the patient is height. So we use the longer trocar cannula, zero degree, OptiView, and make the space till the pubic ramus in such a way that we are able to see each and every fiber. Eyes don't lie. I missed a question for Dr. Bay. Please give us some tips on how you will raise the peritoneal flap superiorly. That was one question that was available. So initially we were all taught to at the end of the uh, dissection, hold the superior peritoneal flap with a uh, atraumatic grasper and bring it down. Carbon dioxide will enter between the peritoneum and the rectus muscle, and it will build about a one or two centimeters superior flap. And this is important, especially if the peritoneal incision is very low down. But if you have made a peritoneal incision higher up, this will not become a very important issue. You don't have to raise it for one or two centimeters. Just five millimeters is enough. You just want to take a bite and it will be enough. So understand the geometry. If you give a higher incision, the pressure of creating a superior peritoneal flap will be less. I agree with Dr. Baik because you know, this is what I do. I am a great proponent of TAPP repair and I don't do that many e -tab, but I've always felt if you take a higher flap, then you know you don't have to keep dissecting a superior flap because by the time you have gone down into the space of Ritzias, you've got a huge hole there in which you can stick whatever size mesh you are comfortable with. And I think that is one good, good way of going about it. Dr. Bhatia, the question to you from you know one of the you know like channel members is what for ETAP, any configuration of other than midline is what will you use? Absolutely. There are surgeons who are using the secondary ports as lateral ports also. And lateral to the semilunar line or lateral to the inferior epigastric line, one and second maybe in the midline. But we 
as as it was told that we started our hernia practice in 94 we were doing tapp then we shifted to tp and we were very comfortable with infra umbilical two secondary ports in the midline right from beginning and today also when i am doing the etaps in 90% of my cases then also we make these secondary ports in the midline even if i am doing the right side then i am standing on the left side of the patient and if i have to do the left side dissection then i shift myself to the right side and we don't have to make the four ports for etap bilateral repair so means that with the help of two infra umbilical midline ports we are comfortable in doing both sides but i don't have anything against only caution is that when we are putting the lateral secondary ports please do not cause any injury to the inferior epigastric vessels or the branches of it which are going into the rectus muscle unnecessary ooze should be avoided i do not want to see the fresh human blood in my field it should be absolutely clean because if we cause lot of oozing bleeding later on the this these patients will have more seroma formation thank you so much sir i mean i i've seen some of your repairs from so the 90s down to whatever i've seen now i think you know like you still stick to whatever principles you've been telling us to do thank you so much on that the next question again to you dr bhatia is when will you start insufflation in an opti view wonderful question as soon as you go into the muscle and you have gone just above the level of the posterior rectus sheath that is the time i connect the gas and switch it on and that is the time that i request the anesthetist to put the patient 10 degree head low and that is the time that the table is broken so what i mean so the, the gas itself creates a beautiful space for us to drawn over the posterior rectus sheath and the arcuate line thank you thank you so much one last question to you before i move over to the other you know speakers what is extended etap this is as as you know that horge dies and edward felix had written a beautiful publication and in this they had mentioned initially as extended tep for inguinal hernia then many people many start surgeons started after 2012 they started doing this extended and then they labeled it as enhanced so it is a basically i i would do like this that if i am drawing a painting and uh, you must have seen all the painters what they do is that they go behind and then see from a distance whether my painting is doing a good job is it looking good or not so again the thinking is that if you have an extra space and if you are seeing from a distance you have more space to work on one second thing is that why i have drifted or shifted myself to eat up is that as ismail was also pointing out that once we are working supra laterally then if the posterior rectus sheath has to be given in season yes it can be given but if we are doing e tap we are very very clearly seeing the plane between the posterior rectus sheath and the peritoneum once the peritoneum is taken down then you are able to place in a size of even 15 by 15 size mesh proline mesh also so we get extra space extra vision enhanced vision extended vision and ultimately i am letting go that my retractors my assistants are not getting the blame of not retracting the anterior rectus sheath properly or i am not taking blaming them for putting the suture at a wrong place it is my optical trocar which is doing all the job for me and my eyes are doing the job thank you so much because you know i i learned something from you today from the bariatric length optic optimum trocar which you use I think that seems to be doing good job. Morley, so just a second. Or... I yeah, just a second. I would not agree with Ismail if I am allowed to say of not fixing the mesh. I would push and fix all my meshes because we have seen patients in which the scrotum had the mesh inside, and then I phoned the surgeon. He said that sir, we don't fix it the mesh. So I said that in on day four only your patient is having the mesh in the scrotum. So that is a reason that we strongly believe that we should fix the mesh either with suture or with the tacker. I mean that's another argument in itself whether you fix or not to fix the mesh because with the concomitant you know like 
comorbidities or the uh, complications of having pain, you know, late pain, so on and so forth. I think, you know, like maybe that is something which I'm not going to go on to it. I've got one question from Dr. Amit Srivatsava. What are the disadvantages of tap for inguinal hernia? It is simple, easy to learn, comfortable ergonomically. When is ETEP preferred over TAP? The question to Dr. Ismail, please. I believe uh, uh, for the TAP, uh, we are adding uh, three steps uh, to the uh, TAP. Uh, we all know that when we, we have to enter into the peritoneal cavity, again, I mean, previously, that was uh, uh, one problem with the endoscopy hernia repair where uh, there were a lot of bowel injuries. So unnecessarily, mm -hmm. you are entering into the peritoneal cavity, mm -hmm. and uh, then we have to cut the peritoneum. We hold the dissection, what you are doing in TAP also, same as in the TEP. Once you cut the peritoneum, then it is mandatory that you have to fix the mesh. So with fixing the mesh, it I mean, uh, uh, there are two points. One is the pain later. The second thing is uh, the cost. Uh, here in the hernia, we know that uh, it is just the defect in the peritoneal cavity through which the peritoneum is going. And there is a potential space where you can just separate these two facial planes and put the mesh and coming out. And uh, we can see the comfort of the patient is too much because uh, they will just sit up in the bed in the evening of the uh, hernia because there is no suturing, there is no cutting, there is no... So uh, that is the beauty. But of course, if there is a large hernia, uh, there are conditions where you have to put the mesh. So um, the I, 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 I'm not telling anything against the tap because... Uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of advantages of the tap, as I've shown. Uh, if it is a reducible hernia, you can go in and you can reduce. Uh, this is uh, uh, depends, I believe, all the training, what you are going to get. I mean, whichever the technique you are using, uh, it should be good in your hands. So if you are trained a tap surgeon, let it do that. But of course, I mean, theoretically speaking, uh, you are adding three steps uh, to the uh, the, the hernia repair by doing a tap. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ismail, because for want of time, I think, you know, like I'm going to ask one question to Dr. Baig before we finish. He spoke about anatomical mesh and he showed the anatomical mesh. What is your choice? Would you use a preformed anatomical mesh given by a company or would you want to size a mesh for your defect? Right. So there is absolutely no data to support that anatomical meshes or preformed meshes have uh, any better than the flat meshes, especially when the cost can be uh, prohibitively five times, six times more. So uh, you're right that there is no data. Uh, having said that, as you know, surgeons tend to evolve with their experience and their, that experience builds data. And uh, Right now, since we have been using anatomical mesh for the last two to three years, we have grown comfortable with it. And comfort is the only reason why I can recommend it. I do not see any reason why this would alter anything else apart or influence anything like recurrence, SSO, SSI. It's not going to do that. But it looks pretty. It fits well. And it's easy to deploy. No struggles at all. Even a beginner surgeon, uh, my trainee surgeons after 10 cases can deploy it. With a flat mesh, they take about 30 to 40 cases. So I think that's the only advantage I can tell you, unsubstantiated, unproven, but coming from the top of my head. Thank you very much, sir. Frost. I think, you know, like as a customer, I think I'm going to finish with the last speaker. Just one question from the, you know, like channel. Uh, this is to Dr. Bhatia from Dr. Anish. Sir, in an ETEP, what about using glue for fixing the mesh? He's got something beyond that also. I'm not going to go ask that question. We're just going to talk about mesh, mesh fixation with glue in ETEP. With the suture and needle? Glue. Come glue? Again, sir. Yeah, with the glue. Glue, glue, glue fixation. It. Yeah. Yes, good. But my answer is that I have not liked glue at all. 
we had used in the initial phase but frankly i have a lot of reservations and the literature also does not support much usage because once you are putting in the glue it may fall down onto the vas or onto the important structures and that can cause unnecessarily adhesions later on so our thinking is that we do not use the glue we use the tacker or the suture and that's it but we always fix the mesh and anatomical mesh company corporate says that it should not be fixed but Dr. Salfraz had shown that it should be fixed. So our thinking is that if you are putting the large size anatomical mesh, they, you may not fix it, but we always fix the flat meshes. Right. Because there's one more question which have just been opened up. I think we are going to take this. I'm surely this is going to be the last question because we were already four minutes past 9.30. So this is for all the three of you. If you want to give your comment on immediate post-op dress, dressing, especially if scrotal support is necessary in all or not in all cases of TEP, TAPP. I think it was partly answered by Dr. Ismail. Maybe, you know, like, Sarfraz, you want to take that? Yeah, scrotal support uh, doesn't, again, just like many things in life, doesn't have evidence, <laughs> but we all do it. And uh, patients seems to uh, enjoy it. Uh, they love to be told that this is something that you uh, need to do for a month or three months. Even if you don't like it, they will probably hear it from another surgeon and they will do it. So I think a common sense answer is just do what they want. And uh, what harm can a scrotal support do? What is the side effect of having a scrotal support? So if there's no side effect of a scrotal support, just do it, yeah. <laughs> no, but honestly speaking, I say other way around. We do not give any extra compression from outside. We are against the scrotal support. We are pro, pro, pro hemostasis. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. I think, you know, to, you were talking only about the patient being a surgeon. It's like putting a drain tube. It always gives you that satisfaction that nothing is going to go wrong when you put in scrotal support. I mean, I do put a scrotal support, let me be very honest, just to make sure that I go to bed, sleep well, thinking that there is not going to be a steroma that is going to be formed. <laughs> so that's my view to it. And maybe wrong, may not be scientific, but thank you so much. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mohamed Ismail, Dr. Safras Beg, and uh, Dr. Bhatia for joining and making this, you know, a very, very, you know, like informative session on hernia repair, one hernia repair and how you do it. I think we can keep on going. I think that's one thing about hernia that I've always found. If you were to ask questions, I think you can do ask so many other questions. That's why I always say to a patient, there's more than 150 operations done for inguinal hernias, but what is standardized is the laparoscopic repair or the Lichtenstein open repair. So on that account, you know, thank you so much. You threw so much of light into what is to be done and what is not to be done. Thank you, Dr. Sidesh and Dr. John Abraham John for you know giving us this opportunity. I'd like to thank you know the president of ASI for giving us the opportunity and making it a good good program. Thanks once and all for everything. If we haven't got any further to say, we'd call it a good good evening and then you know like have a lovely night. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mulidharan, and all the excellent faculty. And I'm sure today the person who is smiling is our president because he has felt that by doing such sessions, we would get the maximum out of these experts and also most beneficial by sticking on to the basic topics. And today, no doubt, we have achieved that. So I'm happy that President has brought out this type of program, short, crisp, and very meaningful and helpful. So thank you very much for all these questions. And, uh, and also the number of questions you answered also shows it has generated a lot of interest. So uh, with this, I would request our President to come in with a sharp comment and then Followed up with, uh, if at all, Dr. Praveen wants to, Suryam, she wants to have a word. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you, speakers, for an excellent uh, video presentation. And, uh, and of course, sparing your valuable time with us. And I know that Sarfaraz is on a Valentine dinner with his wife, of course. But uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you very much, Sarfaraz. Uh, I, I have a, the problem that I see today is that everybody said that inguinal hernia, laparoscopic repair started in 1995. 
So we are about 25 to 30 years into laparoscopic inguinal hernia, but still it hasn't taken off. Like many people are, hardly many people do it. Unfortunately, especially in tier two, tier three cities, it is probably because there is no proper consensus. We saw three speakers with three different opinions, whether to fix or not to fix, to be or not to be is the question. So unfortunately, we don't have any substantiative clear evidence to do a hernia in whatever way that you propose to do it. I'm extremely uh, worried about this, that after, even after 30 years, our experts have not been able to come up to a conclusion. Right, that's that's my, my uh, two bits. Uh, but any, nevertheless, thank you very much uh, for an excellent show. I would like to emphasize on my ASI time, which I had started this year. And every Wednesday will be on ASI time from 8.30 to 9.30. First Wednesday is on the webinars. The second Wednesday is today. It's going to be on how I do it videos. We'll get experts to do this. Uh, every every uh, month would be a different topic. And the third uh, Wednesday would be uh, for uh, residents especially, but the National Skill Enhancement Program, taking uh, uh, normal topics of interest to them. And the fourth would be on lateral talks, like so many other things, like... Uh, Gardening, say for example, or finance, or for shares, or Praveen Bhatia's uh, balcony with a beautiful garden could come up in there, with a Buddha statue in it. So many things are there. And the fifth, uh, of course, on uh, Wednesday would be on uh, passions of, of surgeons, uh, the extracurricular uh, the things that they do. Right. Anyway, thank you very much once again uh, for a lovely show. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in ASI time next Wednesday, same time, same day, next Wednesday, that's the third Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Niyagi. Thank, Thank you. you. would like to have a word, quick word, only one. Praveen, is there a much here? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I really appreciate our uh, Dr. Praveen's efforts to, you know, consider this basic topic because uh, during our recent days, Hernia was considered to be GR1, GR2 surgery. But with the introduction of laparoscopy, it has really become a very specialized job with a lot of technical demands. So, and uh, with these uh, imminent faculties, they have really shown all details very in very precise way. And they have shared their knowledge and wisdom in this complex procedure. So, thank you very much. And... Uh, I also request sir, all the participants sir, to spread these words of ASI time to their friends and colleagues so that more and more their surgeon colleagues are benefited. So thank you very much, everyone, for the active participation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Praveen. Praveen. And we'll say goodbye to everyone to meet again on next Wednesday, 8.30. The last comment that don't whatever procedure you would like to choose, you have to go and learn it from the experts. Any one of them you have in mind. And our president has an uh, answer for that also. Look up to our website for such programs where you can visit, get trained, and do it safely and in a proper way so that the patients get benefit in the right way. Thank you very much again, and good night. And a special Thank thanks you. to Thank our you. advisor, Dr. Santosh Abram, who is always in the back to guide us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much.